So good evening, everyone. Thanks again for joining us uh, tonight for a visit with the Spelman Museum of Stamps. Uh, we're gonna talk about the history of the post office uh, by viewing images of vintage US postage stamps. We're gonna learn about the history of the US post office from the first letters carried on the Boston Post Road to the current postal controversies. Hear about the expansion of the post office after the revolution, the introduction of home delivery, the short-lived Pony Express, the carrying of mail by railroads, buses, and trolleys, the start of parcel post, the first air mail and catapult mail, mailbox designs, V-mail of World War II, the start of zip codes, postal strikes, the introduction of forever and personalized stamps, and the impact of email on the post office's current financial situation. G. Henry, is that all? That's all you have planned, huh? You said uh, I had three hours. You told me <laughs> I could go till uh, the, the uh, Tonight Show starts. So. Yeah, one hour, one hour. I can, I, can, I can get it all in. If not, uh, we'll skip a few. No, oh, no, I know you will. So we're going, to, we're going to see images of, uh, of uh, many creative ways mail has uh, been carried, including using rockets, dog sleds, camels, and mules down into the Grand Canyon. Oh, boy. So uh, briefly, uh, Henry has a long bio. I'm going to shrink it down to two sentences. I wouldn't bother with that. <laughs> Don't even bother with that. Come on, Henry. Henry uh, is the education director at the Spelman Museum of Stamps at Regis College in Weston since 2004. He is a retired social studies teacher and high school principal for 35 years and has served uh, as, a, as a docent at the Museum of Fine Arts and at the Harvard Peabody Museum, in addition to giving historical tours of Boston. So all 40 of us watching live on Zoom, and I'm sure the dozens that'll be watching on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Henry for joining us here tonight. And Henry, the floor is yours. Take You're a look. the roar of the crowd here. Well, thank you, Robert, and I appreciate you inviting me. This is the third time that I've been uh, uh, up here at uh, Tewksbury, and so it's always, and I'm I have to throw in a plug for Robert because you folks in Tewksbury are very lucky to have him uh, at your library. He just, I've never seen anybody who runs more fantastic shows than, than you do, Robert. So, all right, we'll get started. Uh, but I, uh, I have a little uh, quiz for you. If you have a piece of paper, uh, you might just want to try doing this uh, as I'm presenting. But I want you to list as many famous Henrys that you know that which should, would be on postage stamps. And I will give you a a list at the end of my presentation, but see how many Henry, with one uh, uh, notice about at least American postage stamps, you have to be dead to be on an American stamp. So any famous Henry's that are still alive, uh, don't bother putting them on, on your list. I'll give you the answers at the end. And then uh, if you do uh, like stamps or you wanna use stamps to study a little history, uh, we produce a monthly almanac calendar where we feature a stamp for each day of the, uh, the, the week uh, that represents a historic event. And for example, today, the 14th is the anniversary of the signing of the uh, peace treaty uh, in uh, Paris, ending the American Revolution. And there's a, a stamp celebrating that. So if you'd like that, just email me. I'll be happy to get it to you. All right, so let's get into the, uh, to the program. This is a nice set of uh, stamps that kind of outlines all the various duties of, uh, of uh, men and women in the post office. And of course, uh, the, uh, postal workers have been essential. And you know that expression, neither snow nor rain, and now neither need the pandemics. I know there have been some concerns about postal service because there have been thousands of postal workers who have come down with, uh, with COVID and that has affected some, some services. But speaking of COVID, uh, stamps like to publicize uh, events and uh, I think about 10 or 12 state uh, countries have issued uh, stamps related to COVID. The most interesting one is that one on the bottom, that's from Austria, and it's made out of toilet paper. Uh, interesting little uh, uh, way that they're talking about uh, relating the COVID to the, what's happening. And some other countries, you can see there's, uh, uh, that's Iran and Switzerland. Uh, by the way, Switzerland always has four, like, tries to put, four languages on their stamps since they speak four languages. And it doesn't say Switzerland on the stamp, it says Helvetia, which is what they call, uh, that's the old Roman name for uh, Switzerland. 
And uh, I'm going to skip these. These were done. I did these uh, for an, another program. But I, I did find out in the news that our new Secretary of the Treasury is a philatelist, which is just a fancy term for a, a stamp collector. And according to one report, she has a, a, a collection valued in the uh, 40 or 50,000 range. Okay, the Spelman Museum, and I hope some of you have been there, but if you haven't, I hope when we reopen, uh, you'll come down and visit us. We're on the uh, Regis College campus. We've been around uh, since 1963. Uh, that's Cardinal Spellman. If any of you have uh, grown up in, uh, on, in the Boston area or down in New York, you're familiar with the name Spellman. There's a Cardinal Spellman High School down in, the, in New York. There's a Cardinal Spellman High School in uh, Brockton, but he was a big stamp collector. And uh, he was uh, very influential in the Catholic Church. He was called the American Pope. He was good friends with the Franklin Roosevelt. But his stamp collecting was one of his hobbies. And uh, he had quite a collection. He was voted philatelist of the year in the 1950s. He donated his stamps to the Sisters of St. Joseph, which is the teaching order at uh, Regis. And that's how the museum got built there. Uh, he, he studied uh, to be a priest in Rome, and that's where he picked up the stamp collecting habit. So on uh, May 4th, 1963, which was the anniversary of his birthday, he and about a thousand other people, including the Postmaster General at the time, showed up in Weston and uh, opened up the, uh, the museum. Uh, he was, as I said, well known. He, even got him, he hasn't been on an American stamp, but he did get himself on a Nicaraguan stamp when he visited there. Uh, there are some other stamp museums in the country. There's this kind of unique one in Delphos, Ohio, that was started by a retired postmaster. It's more a postal history uh, museum than a, a stamp museum. And of course, the uh, National Postal Museum in Washington. Uh, if you ever get, to, when you do get to Washington, you definitely have to, to visit that. That's a much bigger museum. It's a public museum. Uh, we're a private museum, but it's certainly well worth the visit. Okay, let's get into the uh, little uh, chronology of the, uh, of the post office. Uh, I'm going to skip these. I did some uh, I did a New Hampshire uh, program, so I looked for some famous people related to uh, New Hampshire. Uh, but I did find one person related, oops, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the oldest continuous post office in uh, the United States, up in Hinsdale, which I don't think is too far from uh, Tewksbury. It's been operating since 1816, uh, so. Uh, and I did find this stamp. I, I found out that Ann Sullivan, who was the uh, tutor for, uh, Helen Keller uh, was born in Agawam, but uh, was an orphan, I believe, and uh, was uh, transferred to the Tewksbury Hospital, treated very uh, poorly, and then eventually went to Lowell, but uh, she is connected with, with Tewksbury uh, history. Uh, a couple other interesting post offices. The smallest post office is down in the Everglades, only 61.3 square feet. Uh, the uh, uh, post office in Oregon is called the is in a town called Bridal Vale, and it shouldn't have a post office because the population is so small. But it does uh, because people by the thousands send their wedding invitations to the uh, post office to have them canceled. And you can see a, a cancellation from uh, 2015 there for uh, uh, Bridal Vale. And then uh, speaking of cancellations, a lot of people like to have their uh, Christmas cards uh, with a cancellation related to Christmas. Here's one from Noel, Missouri, but there's some other ones from, uh, this is Bethlehem, New Hampshire. There's a Bethlehem, Connecticut. There's about 25 uh, towns and cities that have a Christmas relation. And you can send your stamped letters to them and they'll put the cancellation on. And with the Valentine's Day coming up in uh, about a month, there's a number of towns that have a, a, a love connection. One of the most popular ones is Loveland, Missouri and Loveland, Colorado. And volunteers come in uh, a few weeks before Valentine's Day, and as you can see, just cancel them with special cancellation. This, by the way, is the new uh, love stamp uh, coming out for 2021. I'm not sure if it's in the post offices yet, but it's quite an attractive stamp. Okay, the post office, as we all know from the news, is suffering a, a financial uh, situation. It is an independent agency. It, it does not officially get any money from the government. That's been the case since 1971 but it has a lot of restrictions on it by Congress and contracts. And so that is uh, creating some finances. Uh, There's a little cartoon here. You're all familiar now with forever stamps. And the clerk here is 
telling the uh, patron that he no longer has forever stamps. We now do taking it day by day. And of course, there's been a lot of talk in the newspapers about privatizing the post office and uh, other things. But uh, red ink is, is one of the problems with the post office and hopefully that can get resolved. Okay, that's slogan again, neither snow nor rain nor heat, uh, but the budget cuts uh, are affecting uh, some services. It's still the cheapest way to, uh, to send a package by law. Uh, they have to be uh, cheaper than uh, UPS and uh, FedEx and the others. And if you uh, travel to other countries, you'll know it costs a lot more to mail a letter in the foreign countries than it does here in the United States. 55 cents is still a pretty good deal. Uh, the expression comes from uh, the uh, Herodotus is the Persian Wars about uh, a, a coastal, a carrier bringing the news. And that's where we get the uh, expression. Uh, the James Farley building, if you're from the New York area, this is the uh, post office that's located in uh, Madison, Madison Square, has about 2,000 workers, built in 1912. And the official, unofficial motto, neither snow nor rain nor sleet, is inscribed at the top of this building. The post office technically doesn't have a model. And uh, if you look at the architecture, it's done by the same architects uh, who did the uh, Boston uh, Public Library. And it's huge. It used to be open 24 hours a day, but about uh, 10 years ago, that uh, system uh, stopped. And if you uh, remember, those who used to do their taxes, let's say 20, even 20 years ago, many post offices would stay open till midnight to, uh, get, so you could get your April 15th cancellation. That's no longer the case since most people are filing their taxes uh, by the, uh, the web. But I just interesting this little, this is not a postage stamp, this is a revenue stamp. Uh, and our government has taxed almost everything, including the marijuana in 37. Post office has been in some controversies. Uh, there are about 16 murals uh, in 12 states that have been covered up because the theme is uh, considered racist mostly racist, some of it uh, anti-feminist, so uh, debate. But these murals, uh, there were five of them in New Hampshire post offices, and in Massachusetts, there's about 35 murals. Some of them are uh, somewhat close to you. Uh, and they were done during the uh, Works Progress Administration to give uh, work to artists during the uh, Depression. And uh, the post office even issued this set of five stamps featuring five of those murals. Okay, who worked for the post office? Quite a few people. Some of you out there may have uh, had a job, maybe it's certainly at uh, Christmas time or uh, sub summertime sub as a substitute for that. But these are some people, famous people who had various jobs in the post office, including Abraham Lincoln. And they, some of these people have been honored on stamp. Uh, and so let's get into the start of the post office. Of course, the uh, pilgrims arrive in 1620. In fact, uh, when we uh, reopen the museum, we have a very nice exhibit that has been prepared uh, celebrating the anniversary, the 400th anniversary of the uh, uh, Mayflower landing. In fact, that stamp on the left is uh, the latest stamp honoring the Mayflower. And then, so that was 1630. By 1639, uh, there was a somewhat official post office in the Fairbanks Tavern in uh, by just by the waterfront. And uh, ships coming in would uh, bring in uh, letters and they would be uh, posted and there would be a fee charged uh, for delivering them. So uh, it wasn't any government run agency, but it was a way of getting uh, letters from uh, uh, England, especially to Boston. And then uh, they started uh, connecting between Boston and New York and going down into Philadelphia. You're probably familiar with the term Boston Post Road, which actually starts in Boston. There are three routes, um, three routes that take it through um, the northern route, which is uh, Route 20, goes right through Weston. Uh, there's a central route and then the southern route, which is basically uh, US 1. And those three roads, each are about 200 miles long. They all convened in uh, New Haven, and then they went down to uh, uh, New York City. And there are several books, uh, maybe the library has some of these. Uh, they all give you a nice uh, history of uh, postage before the revolution, as well as especially the, the importance of uh, the King's Road, which eventually went up into Maine and all the way down into Georgia. The man who oversaw it for a number of years, of course, is 
Ben Franklin, who everybody knows, I think, was our first postmaster, not only for the United States, but actually for Canada. Um, the colonies were split in Virginia, and he uh, took, care, took over the northern section. Being a very inventive man, he made a number of improvements to the uh, post office system. He visited all 13 colonies and to see how mail was being uh, carried then. Uh, he set up what were called milestones. This is an example of his odometer, which I understand he attached to the back of his carriage and would mark off each mile uh, because they used to, you paid by the distance when you mailed letters back then, unlike today. And so he would get uh, milestones. And uh, I should have known this, but a lot of those milestones uh, were made by people who also know, made gravestones. But there are about 20 or 30 that are still on Route 20. Uh, some of them have been restored. A couple of them are in museums. And every now and then, another one is, is found. Uh, here's one. Uh, indicating that Ben Franklin actually was the one who uh, established it. Now, he was also, his brother or his cousin uh, was a whaler down in, uh, the, in Nantucket. And his uh, first, that person told uh, Franklin about the Gulf Stream, which the British did not really believe in, but the Gulf Stream made it a lot faster to get the ships back to uh, deliver the mail. And so that was another one of his innovations as a postmaster. Then of course the revolution comes about and uh, the colonists did not trust the British post office. So they set up their own uh, postal system and William Goddard uh, was listed as the uh, first postmaster of it. And then the second Continental Congress came around and uh, Mr. Goddard did get the job and they gave it to Ben Franklin instead. He didn't last very long. Uh, he went over to uh, France to uh, try to su get support from the French. And uh, just in, I believe it was his son who then took over. Uh, the most important thing about the post office in the early days was not so much letters. Many uh, people just didn't send letters. It was expensive, but it was getting the newspapers out. And if you were a printer, uh, you also could did your work for the post office because you got to send your newspapers either free at a very low cost. So uh, without, uh, it was basically the way all information got out. And so when the mail was delivered, everybody would try to get to town to see what was in the news. And then uh, after the uh, revolution, they started carrying uh, mail in coaches. And uh, up there in uh, Concord, New Hampshire, was very famous for uh, its uh, coaches, which were used not just for mail, but for passengers as well. And then uh, the Articles of Confederation did have a postal system, but it was not uh, uh, effective. And then when the Constitution was written in 1788, uh, 89, they actually put the post office in the Constitution, realizing how important it was and that uh, Congress would establish the roads for the post office. And then a man named Samuel Osgood became the first postmaster, and there were about 75 post offices in the new country. In fact, the uh, stamp club over in uh, Chelmsford is the Samuel Osgood Stamp Club. And then there was the big westward expansion. Uh, the, the war ended, uh, the United States took over the territory uh, for Ohio, uh, Indiana, and Illinois are, that was called the Northwest Territory. And then Napoleon sold us the uh, uh, Louisiana Purchase. So all these areas, the settlers were coming in, and of course, they wanted to get the news. And so the post offices kept expanding. Uh, here's a stamp celebrating uh, Kentucky statehood. Uh, and then of course, uh, travel was done not only by horses and by carriages, but also by uh, steamboats and ferries could carry the mail. And then there was a uh, little controversy in uh, over abolitionist material, which we think today is controversial. Uh, Southern postmasters were not delivering any uh, abolitionist mail, and it became a, a big issue between the North and the South. Andrew Jackson uh, was the president at the time. I'll say something about stamp collecting for a minute. If you notice that stamp, it's Andrew Jackson. Why is it a seven cent stamp? Well. Back in the late 1930s, they issued stamps honoring all past presidents, and the uh, denomination was the number of the president. So Andrew Jackson was our seventh president, therefore he got himself on a seven cent stamp. Uh, and uh, Jackson also started something else with post offices. Uh, the people who got the post office job as postmaster were nine times out of 10 political connections. And when he came in, a lot of postmasters lost their job and he put in his, his folks. 
Now, stamps didn't come along until 1840. People think we've always had stamps, but no. The first stamps were not until 1840, and it wasn't in the United States. It was in uh, Great Britain, and the stamp over on the left is called the One Penny Black, and that was the very first postage stamp ever made. The man on the right is a man named Roland Hill. He's the man who invented stamps. Took a little piece of paper, put Queen Victoria on the front, glue on the back, sold it real cheaply. You could deliver your mail anywhere in Great Britain for a penny, and the idea caught on. Also, just a little piece of trivia, you'll notice the stamp, that's a British stamp, but it doesn't say Great Britain on it. Great Britain is the only country in the world that doesn't have to put its name on a stamp because they were the first to have stamps. But they do have the silhouette of the region, either the king or the queen. You can see Queen Elizabeth uh, there. And then the Daniel Webster uh, heard about the stamps and he introduced a resolution in Congress to have the post office issue stamps that was in 1840. It's somewhat like today, Congress takes a little bit of time. And so it wasn't until 1847 that the United States issued its first postage stamp. We had a slightly different rule than England. We did charge by the distance. First 300 miles was five cents. Uh, the next over that was 10 cents. Uh, ben Franklin getting on there because of the first postmaster general and of course, uh, George Washington. Now every country in the world has, uh, has stamps. Uh, the first forever stamps came about uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, I'm sorry, 20 years ago. And uh, that obviously says, I should mention, by the way, postal rates will be going up on the 24th, but not for first class mail. Only if you add another stamp, you have to go up 10 cents. First adhesive stamps were tried out in 74. They weren't very successful until a number of years later. And now you can make your own postage stamp and you can be alive to be on the stamp. So you can order your own postage stamp with your digital picture or your company or some of your nonprofit groups. And the post office will print them as will a company called Zazzle. So, uh, and of course, clicking stamps can be a little bit of a problem. And stamps were attractive, not just for collecting, but decorating. This gentleman decided to decorate his whole car with the posted stamps. And there's stories about people decorating or wallpapering their room with posted stamps. And, you can do a lot of decorating with different items with stamps. Uh, there are a thing called semi-postals. If you like to help a charity, you can buy a stamp at, at face value, right now 55 cents, and then you'd spend another five to eight cents and the money would go to charity. And these are some of the uh, charities, breast cancer, Alzheimer's research, of course, uh, aid to the uh, victims of 9-11 and saving the species. Uh, now, so now we're getting close to the Civil War and people are then going out to California in 1849, 48, 49. And so they did that to get the mail out there. Up until uh, this overland mail delivery, which went through the Southern part of the country, uh, all mail that went to California would go by ship. And that could take three months to six months. And so some, what they would try to do is take the, uh, po the ships from Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and head to Panama. The ship would land in Panama, they'd put it on a bunch of donkeys, go across the isthmus, and then put it on another ship uh, to get up to California. So the gold rush brought thousands and thousands of people to California uh, with uh, war uh, threatening. They wanted to certainly know what was going on. There was some talk that they might even had declared themselves their own country. But the Pony Express came about to uh, deliver mail from St. Joseph, uh, Missouri to Sacramento in about 15 days. So the trains would take the mail to St. Joseph, they would be put on with the postal wires and they would go. Post office, the uh, uh, Pony Express only lasted, even though it's very well known, only lasted about uh, 18 months because the telegraph came in. There's a Samuel Morse, the inventor. And uh, just checking my time. Uh, and uh, so the, even as the Pony Express riders were riding across the country, they could see the telegraph wires going up. The other thing I like about collecting stamps is even on a little piece of paper, you can get some history. If you notice carefully underneath the uh, telephone pole, it says, what hath God wrought? And that was the very first message that Samuel Morse uh, did on his telegraph to see uh, if it was working or not. Then the Civil War comes around, and that's when the residents in cities that had more than 50,000 people could get their mail. They didn't have to go to the post office anymore. They could get it delivered to them. One of the reasons supposedly was because uh, 
people, wives and uh, families would have to go to the post office to find out, uh, get letters from the uh, front and also get sad news that they, maybe they had lost someone in the family. So a couple of postmasters said it was kind of too bad that people waited in, in line and then found very bad news. So they thought, let's deliver the mail uh, to their homes and uh, make it better. And of course, uh, we had some debate uh, about uh, mail-in voting in the last election, but uh, Civil War troops were allowed to uh, vote by mail. They either had their own post offices or they uh, were allowed to go home to, uh, to vote. And the Confederacy, of course, when the uh, Civil War uh, broke out and the states seceded, uh, they did not obviously use the uh, US post office. They created their own post office. And uh, unlike the uh, US rule about only dead people on stamps, they did put Jefferson Davis on the stamp. And that statue to the right is a statue of the postmaster for the Confederacy. And then uh, coins were in the short supply during the war. So stamps became currency. In fact, they're still legitimate currency. The stamps would be put in these uh, little containers and uh, used as coins. Uh, then trains, of course, the first trains started carrying the mail even in the 1830s, but uh, uh, ma mainly mail was being transported by trains, but it was only being transported, it wasn't being sorted. And so in the 1860s, they started experimenting with picking up the mail, sorting it, and getting it to the next station. And this was basically the way mail was carried up until uh, 1977. That's when the last mail train went. It was a very good job for uh, uh, mailman, but you had to be very efficient. In, uh, you had to take several very strict tests to see if you could sort mail very quickly. And then, of course, the uh, railroad uh, meet in Promontory Point, and uh, that brings the uh, rail travel out to the west and again increases uh, settlement and delivery, faster delivery of the mail. Then the penny postcard came around. Uh, the first postcard of a penny was in 1869, but this was a nice cheap way for you to to get a message about, and we started issuing ours in 1873. And then in 1907, uh, picture postcards uh, came about. Okay, you could, uh, it used to be though, you could only uh, write an address and no message, and then you could start putting messages on the back. And then there was an interesting thing, uh, the dead letter office. And letters uh, can't be read, poor handwriting, or the address fell off called Nixies. And this goes way back to 1825, and interestingly, the people who worked there were mostly women uh, because of their ability to decipher uh, handwriting a little bit uh, better. And now we still have the dead letter office and the post office makes every effort uh, to deliver mail. And uh, there's been some interesting stories about how people did get their mail, the post office did that. And then here's an example of the, uh, the dead letter office in the early 1900s. And you can see it's all uh, women working there. And then there was a thing called the Universal Postal Union. Uh, you don't think about it, but uh, how come we can deliver mail to another country and how come they can deliver mail to us? So in 1874, there was an agreement and uh, Montgomery Blair had the idea. He was George, uh, Abraham Lincoln's postmaster, but he said, let's get all the countries together and agree that we'll deliver your mail if you deliver ours. And they also made other rules about what can go, what can be carried in the mail, and those kind of things. But that's still in, in effect today. And I believe their headquarters are uh, in Geneva. Then Christmas cards became popular. Uh, 1874, Louis Prang started printing uh, probably the most famous postcard, over a million a year. And I, I just uh, saw in Parade Magazine that over 1 billion Christmas cards were delivered in 2019, even though a lot of people are doing email calls. Then there were things called the mail order catalogs. Uh, the post office did not deliver packages uh, only up uh, after a certain weight. And so companies like Montgomery Ward, Sears would put out these, they would send out catalogs and then people would order it. But the uh, uh, post office, will talk about that in a minute. Then uh, the uh, special delivery came about 1881. First, it was just fast couriers riding. Then uh, bicycles, when they started being introduced in the eight, late 1880s. We started delivering that, and then of course motorcycles. It was an extra fee, but it would often get the letter to you the same day, and that uh, was an innovation. Then a man named Mr. John Wanamaker comes along, uh, Benjamin Harrison, the 24th president of the United States, uh, appoints Wanamaker, who was a businessman. He, he wasn't a uh, didn't work with the post office or anything, 
but he was a very efficient, uh, ran the uh, his famous uh, uh, stores, his uh, department stores in Philadelphia. And so he uh, was hired to uh, give improvement to the, uh, to the post office. And so he came up with a number of things. One of them was uh, selling stamps that he thought collectors would enjoy. And so in 1893, they issued the first commemorative stamps uh, celebrating the anniversary of uh, Columbus. It was the big exposition in Chicago. And this is one of the first stamps. Interestingly, I, I find it anyway, the first woman on an American stamp wasn't even an American. It was Queen Isabella who gave the money to Christopher Columbus. And Martha Washington was the first American woman on the stamp. And then the uh, rural free delivery. Wanamaker sees that the country is growing bigger. The frontier is technically closed. And the people out in the country wanted to get their mail. They didn't want to head to the post office. And so the National Grange was a big uh, lobbyist for rural free delivery, which started in 1896. And by uh, the early uh, 1900s, everybody was getting their mail uh, delivered to them at their home. Then, uh, as I mentioned, the mail catalogs, the post office said, why are we not delivering packages? So in 1913, uh, they instituted parcel post. And these were all the different stamps with the different denominations. These stamps, by the way, didn't last too long. They were too confusing to the mailman. They couldn't tell. They'd have, since all the stamps were the same color, it took them longer to determine if the postal rate was uh, correct or not. Uh, and then uh, because of that, people started delivering things, including uh, live animals. And uh, you can see some chicks here. You still can deliver uh, chicks. Uh, in fact, uh, over in Essex, they used to be the hardy uh, egg company, and they used to ship out lots and lots of chicks. And then housewives or farmers wives would package eggs and send them off on the train down to the next town or two. Uh, bees are still delivered. Not all the bees, but the queen bee. And uh, if the bees do come in, you, the post office gives you a quick call, tells you to come get them. And even in, the, they don't do it today, but back around this uh, 1920s or so, many college students would send their laundry back home to mom to be washed and folded and then sent back in these specially designed laundry cases for the mail. And even for a while, some people tried to mail children. There's a famous story called Mailing May about a little girl in Idaho who wanted to visit her grandmother, couldn't afford the train ticket. So they went down to the post office and they put some stamps on her and mailed them. Uh, that didn't last too long, but uh, there are stories like that. Uh, post office has always been in controversy, segregation, uh, especially down south. Postmasters who were African-American were very often not appreciated and they were harassed. This woman here, Minnie Cox, uh, was actually driven out of her post office down in Mississippi. Teddy Roosevelt was not too enthused about that and he actually closed that post office and made the people travel supposedly 30 miles away to mail their letters. And President Wilson then officially segregates the post office and this created two unions uh, and the National Alliance of Postal Workers organized of African-American workers, a very important uh, union. And I put this in because uh, they actually, at Frederick Douglass's funeral, about 10 of the pallbearers were actually African-Americans from this uh, union. Then there was another interesting way to deliver mail in the city, six of them, and that's pneumatic tubes underground. And uh, they would uh, deliver up to about 600 letters in one tube, and it would get across city very quickly and get uh, delivered. And some of my research showed that Nobody even stuck a cat in there to see if that would make it through or not. Uh, then the postal rates. It's costing uh, one cent and two cents. This is one of the few times that postal rates went up and then went down. And that was during World War I. In order to raise extra money, uh, they raised the price of mailing a letter to three cents. But uh, soon after the war, it uh, came down again. Then airmail was introduced. This is a very famous airmail. Stamps, some of these sell for $100,000. Uh, I'm sorry, a million dollars. Uh, this is called the inverted Jenny plane. You may be familiar with that. Uh, but airmail comes in. Uh, and uh, let's see, where are we? And then eventually, uh, everybody, as I said, getting their uh, mail delivered to their homes. Uh, the post office required you to have a, a mailbox by 1923. Uh, back to airmail. Of course, the uh, planes is very uh, dangerous uh, job, and there were no uh, radios and radar or anything. So uh, they they built these towers, 
and the towers would have arrows next to them and the airline pilots would look for these towers and follow the arrows. The other thing airmail pilots did was follow the railroad tracks uh, because again, uh, maps were uh, not very uh, helpful at that time. And of course, one of the fam most famous airmail pilots was uh, Charles Lindbergh. I like this stamp because there's a pussy cat on it over down in the right hand corner. And uh, this is the first stamp that supposedly had a cat on it. It's from Spain. And the story goes that Lindbergh, when he was getting ready to leave, they asked him if he would take his favorite cat. And he said, oh, certainly not. Way too dangerous a ride to go across the ocean. So. And then uh, catapult mail, which I wasn't uh, too familiar with. But basically, uh, ships would leave from uh, Europe, uh, passenger ships. And on the ship would be a catapult with a small plane on it. And the plane would be loaded up with mail. And then about when they got to about 400, 300 miles from uh, New York City or Philadelphia, they would shoot off this plane and it would get there, the mail get there delivered a day or two earlier, uh, which was all part of the post office, always how fast can we deliver mail? So this was an interesting, it didn't last very long because they started flying over the Atlantic a few years later. And then street boxes, mailboxes came in. This is an example of one of the first ones. So you didn't have to go to the post office anymore to uh, mail your letter. You could just get your stamp and put it on there. And then there were all different ones, four-legged boxes. I thought it was interesting that they painted them olive green for a while because they had all this extra paint from the army. 1955, you may, some of you may remember boxes in red, white, and blue. And then on, from 1970 on, the familiar ubiquitous uh, uh, blue mailboxes. And you can just see some, some examples of that. And if you go into some old office buildings, you may remember the mail chutes that were very popular and a lot of them were very fancy art deco designs. They're no longer legal, they're considered a fire hazard. And some of these, I don't think you'll find too many of these around anymore, they're just a little too small for the volume of mail. And then uh, uh, during the uh, voting count, uh, during the election, there were a few dancing mailboxes down in uh, Philadelphia. And then people have been trying to steal from mailboxes using kind of a fishing line. And a lot of um, mailboxes, especially in cities now, just have a flap, uh, not a flap pull down anymore, just a slot to put it in to prevent some of this. Okay. Um, let's see, we'll go on. The uh, mail was uh, not only at the post office, but in order to help speed mail along, uh, they had trolley cars. And uh, they would travel around the city and you could drop your letters off there, they'd be canceled. And then hopefully uh, if it was in the city, they could be delivered almost the same day. Interesting, I'm not sure if it happened how long, how many times mail was delivered in some of the cities in America, but in London, around the turn of the century, mail in downtown London was delivered 12 times a day. In fact, if you're a fan of British mysteries, they often send their letter in the morning and it gets delivered that afternoon. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a big stamp collector and he uh, got the, uh, stamp collecting hobby uh, much more uh, popular. And uh, he would have his picture in the paper with the stamps. And there was this stamp club you could join as a kid sponsored by Ivory Soap. And if you sent in four uh, Ivory Soap uh, wrappers, he'd send you some uh, stamps. And then buses replaced the trolleys for delivering the mail. This was just around the start of the war. So that stopped. And then uh, interestingly, the, when social security came about, they needed a way to register all the people. So they used the post office for that. And uh, people would go into the post office and that's how uh, they could register. This picture of this woman, by the way, is the first woman to uh, receive her social security check. And she kind of fooled the government because she lived to be 100 years old. So. And then World War II, they had a thing called V-mail. It was too uh, difficult to send full letters on planes. So they would take a microfiche of a special uh, form letter uh, copy it on microfiche, send it over to Europe, read, then take the film, reproduce it on a smaller sheet, and uh, mail would be delivered. And next to ammunition and food, mail is the most important thing for a soldier, especially during wartime. And uh, this is an example of what the letter would, uh, would look like when it, after it was photographed. And then, of course, uh, magazines, the Time magazine put out a, lim a small edition of itself, just uh, all the stories, no advertising, and about half the size, and that could be delivered faster. I just wanted to make a comparison with Sinclair Lewis. 
And then, of course, getting mail from your girlfriend or your wife, most important. And a lot of different things that were so shorthand, S-W-A-K, this means sealed with a kiss. But mail call being very important to, uh, to soldiers. And then there were um, soldiers in POW camps that the Red Cross could try to get mail delivered. Uh, interesting little thing, this stamp on the left, this three cent stamp, the Germans would not accept any letter that had this stamp on it. Why not? Because it said, win the war. And they considered that a little bit of a propaganda. And of course, letters would be censored. Uh, the Pope government had the right to do that, both soldiers' letters, as well as letters going overseas. So, uh, uh, and you can see, the letter would be open and then uh, would indicate that it had been examined. And then with the shortage of men all in the army, uh, women became uh, more employees of the, uh, of the post office. And if you may ever saw the movie Miracle on 34th Street, uh, the male, uh, they used the uh, letters to Santa Claus to prove that there's a, there was a Santa Claus. I won't have time to get into the movie, but I'm sure there's a very good scene where they deliver the, all the letters to Santa Claus to the courthouse where Santa Claus is on trial. And the judge says, well, if the post office delivered all these letters to this man, he must be Santa Claus. Uh, as uh, Robert mentioned on the outline of the program, with different methods to deliver mail, one that wasn't successful was rocket mail. They thought it would work, but uh, no go. But mail has been delivered other ways. There's uh, some uh, uh, reindeers that we use to deliver mail up in Alaska. Uh, the dog sleds uh, have been used, not anymore, but uh, they were popular up until the 70s. Even down in Arizona, uh, the uh, uh, head of the army tried to deliver mail by camel. And of course, going down to the Grand Canyon, three days a week, they put all the mail and packages on mules, and they go down to deliver mail to the uh, uh, Native Americans that are at the bottom. The post office is required to deliver mail everywhere, whereas UPS and FedEx and all the others don't have to uh, deliver packages to certain areas. In fact, before Christmas, they were denying Christmas packages. Uh, unusual post offices. Um, well, we'll skip that one. Here's a, uh, you can still do this, I believe, if you go up to uh, Maine on Rangeley Lakes. There's a mailman who takes a, uh, during the summer, delivers the mail and some other places. I think uh, Lake Winnipesaukee also has a mailbox. Then in 1960, uh, mail still, the system was actually in a little bit of trouble. And so they're trying to, everything to improve efficiency. So the first automated post office comes about down in Rhode Island in 1960. And then in 1963, zip code was introduced. Uh, zip code, zip, all it means is zone improvement plan. Uh, you may have lived in a, a town or a city that had a code. It just added a few uh, numbers to it. A lot of publicity. Ethel Merman did a commercial song for it. Uh, they had games, they had coffee cups, they had posters to get everybody to use, uh, to use uh, zip code. As I said, here, here's a, an example of Dick Tracy uh, zip code board game and even a zip code coffee cup. So zip code became very uh, uh, necessary and you must put it out. And then uh, a number of years ago, they added the extra four numbers. And then by 1969, the post office was really in trouble. And so along comes the Postal Reorganization Act uh, as somewhat of a result of strikes by uh, uh, the mailmen in about six or seven cities. Lasted only a few days, but it, it forced the government to uh, uh, look at the organization. So under President Nixon, the post office became a semi-independent organization, not receiving any money from, from Congress, trying to make its own money. And uh, then unfortunately in 2006, some legislation was passed. Some people believed uh, because there was a neat desire to piratize the post office, they had to pay their pensions in advance with no, no other organization had to do that. And so that's put them in the red and is hoping that this kind of legislation might, uh, might change. Uh, what happened here? Okay, I just, yeah, this is interesting. This, this is a very small stamp. Uh, they thought it might save money, but it didn't. Anyway, that's a very, very quick overview of the, uh, the post office. Uh, I hope I haven't gone too fast, I probably have, uh, but if you want more information about us, uh, we do have a website and uh, we also have an email, certainly send your questions. We do take evaluation, do evaluations and take donations. You'd be surprised how many stamp collections are sitting in attics all over. And uh, even though we're closed, we 
do take appointments for donations and for an evaluation. It costs $50 and we go through your whole uh, collection and see if you might have something that's valuable, although most stamps these days that people collected as, as kids uh, just don't really have uh, that value. Uh, so thank you for uh, watching. And let me check the time here. Henry, you made yeah. perfect time. We got it right in there. <laughs> we had about 10 minutes of questions. Fantastic. So, folks, if you have questions for Henry, get them into the chat. Uh, Henry, do ex presidents automatically get stamps at some point, or is it up to the post office? Well, technically, I'd, I'd have to say it's up to the post office. They have, there's a committee meets four times a year. It has about 15 citizens from a variety of backgrounds. And they uh, take all the suggestions for stamps. My understanding is they get like 30,000 suggestions a year for all sorts of topics. Um, I guess technically they could refuse to put a president. I don't, I don't want to go into that direction. But some people are surprised that Richard Nixon's on a stamp when they see that on display. But the other interesting thing about presidents takes, it used to be 10 years before you got on a stamp. Then they reduced it to five years, and now the rule is a lot looser, and some people who have been dead only two years get on a stamp. But a president will get on a stamp, usually on his next birthday after his, uh, after his death, they will issue the stamp. So, so we have uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Donald, uh, Obama and Donald Trump not on stamps yet, so, but could be a controversy, who knows? <laughs> uh, everything, everything is nowadays, it seems. Uh, well, I, I might, just for that, uh, there are stamps that have that caused uh, controversy uh, about who the, um, for example, Mother Teresa even caused some controversy because people thought it was a religious and should we have religion on stamps? So uh, the post office has to be careful about what subjects they pick. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Mike wants to know, I remember post offices in various businesses, such as drugstores. Uh, Tewksbury has one in a hardware store, uh, or had one, I'm not sure. Uh, does the post office still do this? Yeah, you can, uh, well, I, I just bought some stamps at Walgreens the other day. Uh, Staples did advertise that they had stamps. I think the Christmas rush kind of, Staples I went to the other day didn't have them. Uh, if you remember, and I should probably put it in the show because there used to be uh, stamp vending machines in post offices, and you'd have to pay a little bit extra. But if you needed a stamp on a, on a Sunday night, you could go down and get two uh, ten cent stamps for uh, thirty cents or something. So uh, there's no there's no rule against not selling, but they have to be sold at the uh, uh, face value. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, uh, Steve, uh, who I believe uh, works at the post office, says that the love stamp is available at the post office effective today. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. The uh, first Steve love stamp was uh, the, uh, if you know that, Robert Indiana, the famous love statue. Uh, and if you're driving down the uh, uh, expressway out of Boston and you go past the uh, gas tanks, the Dorchester gas tanks, you know the the, the colored stripes that are on the on the tank, that was designed by Coretta Kent, and she also designed a love stamp. You should put that in the show too. So uh, yeah, the love stamps almost come out every year now. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve says Henry, a lot of fascinating information. Thank you for sharing, and thanks to the library for hosting a very informative program. Kathy says great presentation, learned a lot. Thanks so much. Uh, Dawn says that she has two Confederate stamps. Do these have any value today? Uh, they do. One has to be careful of stamps like that. Even the, the first two stamps that I showed you, the Ben Franklin and the George Washington, uh, a lot of those, for, especially for kids collecting, they would make phony stamps just so a child could fill their stamp album up for the stamp page didn't look empty. Uh, so, but it, it's possible where those stamps came come from, but they don't have great value because they made a lot of them. But uh, when the museum opens, be happy to come down and, uh, and take a look at it. Or uh, there, is a, there is a stamp club that meets over in uh, Chelmsford. 
and somebody there could take a look too. Yeah. But if they want to email me, I can, I can get them more information. Uh, Mariette says, super program, thank you. Renee, I think we may stump you with this one. Um, okay. Henry, Renee says, I saw an exhibit years ago at the Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell of an artist who worked in miniatures. And uh, all his miniatures were stamps uh, of scenes of imagined countries. It was an amazing exhibit. Oh, have, yeah. you ever, have you ever seen this exhibit and do you know who the artist was? Well, you stumped me on who the artist was, but I, I will say there is in stamp collecting world, things called Cinderella stamps. And those are considered stepsisters of the stamps. They're not real stamps. They're designed by people, somewhat of the man she mentioned in that exhibit. And uh, those are, people like to collect those. You make your own stamps. Some people try to fool the post office and put them on envelopes. And sometimes they make it through the mail and they, they become an interesting collecting item. But uh, people make all sorts of uh, stamps. Um, trying to think. Another thing people do is they take a stamp on an envelope and then they expand upon it. And so it looks like a whole scene. I saw one with a, a Richard Nixon stamp and he was behind bars. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, not, that's not unusual. In fact, I, I just was in a museum um, when they have what they call mail art, where people decorate their envelopes and with an address on it, but the whole envelope is, is decorated. Uh, it's not the same as a stamp, but people like to use the mail for, for artistic. And there are, there are some people, there's a, uh, there was a woman in England who her addresses were riddles and hoping that the mailman could interpret, get the answer to the riddle and then be able to deliver it. So people do all sorts of interesting things with mail. But those, the exhibit she saw, uh, uh, people, uh, people like to do that. All right, Henry, we got a few more minutes here. Uh, Mariette says, can you still get pre-posted single sheet airmail folders? I used to send mail to pen pals in other countries okay. that way. Right. Okay, yep. Uh, I'm making notes here because I should include that of a picture. Yeah, they used to be uh, very thin paper that you would fold over. I think that's what she's referring to. Mm -hmm. And it would have a stamp on it already, and then you'd fold it over and glue it. And be, and since the paper was so thin, you didn't pay the uh, airmail rates were more expensive in those days. So you, it it reduced the cost. They don't do that anymore because all all letters are carried by airplane now. If you any any mail going to California or Hawaii uh, is is regular postage. There's still airmail for a dollar twenty to uh, to Europe, but yeah, those and there 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 are a lot of collectibles on that, but that was a way to send a a, a a letter without using just using the envelope in a sense as the letter. Yeah. Uh, Mike, sure that in. Uh, Mike says London had an underground subway mail train. Was something like this ever done in the United States? Uh, not that I know of. I do know that. Uh, in the Capitol building, you know, they have that subway under the Capitol, and I understand that's used for uh, delivering mail to the congressmen and stuff. And I don't know of any, I've never seen any mail that was delivered on a subway. That'd be, that would be an interesting uh, thing. But yeah, if there's a big postal museum in uh, England that has a field trip where you can travel on the underground. If, you, if that person wants to send me an email at uh, I can. I think I can get some information from the Postal Museum there about subway mail. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to uh, we're going to answer two more questions here, Henry. Okay. Uh, what is the largest denomination uh, made today uh, for for an actual stamp? Ooh. <laughs> you know, I, not to be not to be political, but if you remember the hearing that the new postmaster uh, when he was in front of the Congress, they were concerned about his his job and if he was cutting back in service. And so I think a representative from California asked him, how much does it cost to mail a letter or mail a postcard? He didn't know. I'd have to plead the same way here. I'm sure, it would, I think there's at least an $18 stamp because you can, you know, you send things by priority. Mm -hmm. uh, now the post office uses metered mail. Uh, I think $18 might be the highest, but I'd have to check on that. Good question. And then the final question goes to Steve, which brings us back to your very first slide or one of your first slides. 
I came up with 16 Henrys oh, yes, right. okay. that's posted. Are you going to share the list? Oh, yes, I'm glad you, I'm glad you, it's good, because I, all right, let's go. I, he said, how many did he say, 16? 16. All right, let's start with Henry Clay, great uh, compromiser. Of course, Henry Ford, Henry David Thoreau, Patrick Henry, I'm counting Henry VIII on a British stamp, uh, William Henry Harrison, but that's a little cheating, the middle name, uh, John Henry, the uh, famous uh, story, he out, tried to outrace a, a, a train, Henry Stanley, who found Dr. Livingston, again, another British stamp, Henry Knox, who uh, uh, won the battle over, uh, brought the cannons over the mountains to uh, Boston and put them up on Dorchester Heights to drive the British out. Very famous composer, if you remember the Pink Panther, Henry Mancini. Uh, another British stamp, actually, no, this is on a, another, I think a Bulgarian stamp for some reason, Henry Hudson. Uh, one of the most famous, in fact, the first poet to be on a stamp, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I think I showed you the picture of Henry Fonda, the actor. Henry Luce, who started uh, Time Magazine and uh, Life Magazine. It's a, uh, it's not his real name, but O. Henry got himself, uh, he's on a, uh, uh, a stamp. Interestingly, I have a collection of people on stamps who have been in jail and O. Henry is one of them because he, he was arrested for some, some kind of thing. Henry Tanner, probably not well known, but he's a African-American impressionist artist, studied in Paris and then came back to America. And then this one, I didn't know about a man named Henry Arnold from World War II. He actually was a general in the army. And then when the Air Force broke off from the army, he became a general in the Air Force. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven, I got 17, so that first, I give that uh, A plus. We'll give him, a, give him a first class stamp for that. <laughs> and when is Henry Lewis? Did, 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 he come up with, did he come up with any others that I didn't read? Is he still there? We'll give him a chance to respond in the chat. In the chat, okay. Henry, when are you when are you going to get your own stamp, Henry? Well, I made that rule I told you. <laughs> Got to be dead. <laughs> I'll wait. Good point. Uh, Good point. Uh, well, Henry, uh, Steve, so Henry, um, uh, Steve also came up with Henry Comstock. I know that I know the Comstock load, but I don't I don't believe Henry. He's on a stamp. So we'll have to fact check that one. Okay. All right. Well, uh, on that uh, on that note, uh, it is. Uh, a little Do you bit have any others, or that's the only one? Uh, that looks like that's the only one for now. Um, he can. We can have you two connect after the meeting uh, via email tomorrow. If, if always, you, always. Yeah, I'm always surprised that things that come up. And, and the other, just to quickly, uh, people come to the museum and say, "Is there such and such on a stamp?" You can find almost any theme on a stamp. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> countries like the like the uh co uh, the virus why would uh, so anyway uh, stamps can pick all sorts of topics thank you well henry thank you so much for joining us tonight giving us an hour of your time you're so knowledgeable when it comes to stamps and postal history and the post office uh so uh you know really appreciate it and uh, and uh folks i did record today's presentation i'll share it with you tomorrow via email and i'll also send a feedback survey uh, please fill that out let me know what you thought um, and uh, let me know what you'd like for future programs. And I'll make sure to include Henry's uh, contact info, uh, the museum's contact info uh, in the email tomorrow. Yeah, we do, we do, I do have a, a 10 minute uh, virtual tour of the museum. It's on our website, to give right. you an idea. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Yep, thank you all. Thank you, Henry. And I'll uh, be the, the call here in about 10 seconds, all right? Okay, very good. Thanks so much, Henry. Yep. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Yep, thank you.